times. Mm. I have yeah. a question about um, earlier. Uh, um, when the water breaks, mm. this, uh, the, the, when we were talking about spasmal, how long can it actually go in your experience before the baby okay. comes? Good question. In our experience, the first time it happened, it was at 34 weeks of pregnancy. And Dr. Williams, this um, family doctor who helped us, who did a lot of births in those days, and a lot of births being done in the Amish community. And, you know, so it was really important not to have a high C-section rate here. Um, he said, we're going to handle this the conservative way. And I said, what's that? And he said, okay, we're going to have her go to bed and rest a while because we want to see if we can have the water, uh, the amniotic sac, close again. Because, you know, it continues to make amniotic fluid. And uh, he said, so there can be nothing in the vagina, so no lovemaking. Uh, he said to me, uh, maybe it'll seal up again, and that's what we want, because we want her to get some more weeks of pregnancy in here. We don't want a <coughs> premature baby. And this was in 1970, I think, two, before there was a treatment uh, for, you know, immature lungs. Okay, so he said to me, check the fetal heart five times a day. It should stay in the normal range between 120 and 160. Um, and check her temperature that often. And as long as her temperature stays in the normal range, which it varies through the day, but it stays in the normal range, he says, fine. And in fact, what happened was she did seal up, and she went to 40 weeks. So he taught us not to think automatically because the water bag's broken that you're on this, we've got we to gotta induce, we've got to do a C-section or something like that. So that established that as a safe thing to do, and that's what we did each time. Uh, when I read the studies about how often women with the uh, water bag broken going into hospitals had digital exams, uh, I thought, that must be why they get infections. Uh, and, and why the belief happened that there's all these, um, you know, microbes crawling into women and going into the the uterus. Why would it crawl? You know, I mean, how can they, even if the water doesn't seal up again, it keeps rinsing out, you know. So I think they were shoving infectious material with the frequent digital exams, and I observed that they weren't very careful. If you brought a woman with ruptured membranes in, um, people didn't wash her before they did a digital exam. They just just came in, I asked them about it, and they said, well, we, we rely on antibiotics. Well, you shouldn't do that. How about prevention? So, to tell you the truth now, for a long time, we, we did this. We just waited. But now we have obstetricians that will allow us to wait more than about 18 hours. And so, if it's been open that long before the baby, um, is born, we do give antibiotics. But what about induction? Um, not a good reason, I think. And Well, here's how we do induction. So let's say the water breaks and there's no labor, and she's at term, and she calls us up, let's say at night. My water broke. Oh, well, good. That means labor is probably going to start soon. So instead of going, ooh, ooh, now we have a time clock going, and making her worried, I'll say, don't have sex tonight. Um, but I say, um, you, there's a really high chance you'll go into labor. So I'll use a suggestion, a positive suggestion, which is, I use probably, I don't say it will. Yeah? There's a very good chance you'll go into labor tonight. And then if you don't, well, uh, we're going to check you in the morning. And then I might give her, um, after she eats breakfast, I might give her some uh, castor oil. And a lot of times they'll start. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Oh, get castor oil or with something else. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do something like that. And then lots of, you know, uh, making out um, breast stimulation. So, you know, positive suggestion. Don't scare her. Don't worry her. 
uh, so that she thinks, oh, now I'm probably, I got this far, and now I'm probably going to have a C-section. How much oil do you give her? Okay, so after she eats breakfast, um, a tablespoon, it could be with some eggs, or I, I had one woman just take it right off the tablespoon, but most people don't like that. You mix it in with some juice or something, mm. and then wait about an hour. Mm. Then, you know, maybe the body will start to work and she starts to poop, you know. Mm. Um, then she could have another one. And the second one, I, sometimes it will happen if you use a, a what do you call it, a microclist? Mm -hmm. With, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So she really empties the bowel. Mm -hmm. Because instead of going and squirting every few minutes, mm -hmm. get it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then the last one, if she still didn't go into labor after she's had like two soup mm -hmm. spoons, mm -hmm. then the third with some, maybe a little alcohol. Mm. And how long did you wait between the two? An hour. Mm. Yeah, an hour. And you know, a bunch of walking and stuff like that. And that, that will start most people who are at term and when the cervix is ready and right. Would it worry you if the water was a little green in color? A little green color, no. If it's thick. I don't like it to be thick, like, you know, yeah, a thick soup, no. But a little tinged, no. Not as long as the heart rate's good. Is it your experience that women throw up more when they take in the castor oil? No, but if she throws up, she also usually dilates. So I don't mind that, usually. I just want to be sure that she doesn't get dehydrated for throwing up. When you waited, when for the amniotics to when I went around again, when you before when you waited Sorry. until it just when they lay down and you waited until it just got close to the end, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And we waited for six weeks. Six weeks. Ah. Yeah. But after a week or so, when it feel, when it sealed up, yeah, it got up and it was normal, mm. normal life, yeah. Yeah, so that's the only one I remember that was that long a time, and it would, you know, we don't have that doctor alive anymore, so, uh, but he was, I'm glad I learned from him, he was so wise, you know, about what the conservative way was, yeah, because I think we forget often how much this sort of medical orthodoxy is built upon habitual practices, that we don't notice that the dangerous thing the, the thing that probably made the, the infection rates go so high was the undocumented number, usually, of, of exams done. Just because you're in a teaching hospital and that's what they do. And it's a bad practice when the um, membranes are ruptured. We really don't want to check the, we don't want to go into the vagina with our fingers. And the only reason for doing so would be if, it, if maybe the cord had, you, but you can tell with that by listening to the rate, baby's heart rate. So keep your fingers up. Mm. And I think that's really a good thing for the, the husband and the, the, you know, the mother and the father to know, keep your fingers out. Mm. And the other thing I think is good to know is a, a way to prevent postpartum hemorrhage is to put the baby here immediately, don't cut the cord. Mm. And let the cord pulse it. Mm. And then that means that the baby can't be taken away from the mother because the cord's not long enough. <laughs> so there's lots of, you know, just practices that you would see very normal at home that would scare people in hospitals because they usually see something different and they assume, oh, we do it the safest way. And maybe they don't. A lot of times they don't. So. It's uh, late enough, probably, for your hungry to eat. Yeah. Thank you so much.